Uh, as as uh, uh, Richard Harris starts, I should say that uh, I, I, uh, I keep waiting for a phone call from National Public Radio in January uh, complaining because uh, every January when we talk about having moderators for the conference, the very first place we go is the science office at National Public Radio because they've got so many great people. So I feel obliged to avoid that phone call is to urge you all to donate to your NPR affiliate so that uh, their science desk is well funded. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. That's a, that's a wonderful introduction. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll obviously make some adaptations on the fly here, but we'll do, uh, uh, we will uh, uh, have lots of time for your questions as well as, as, uh, as uh, so, uh, talking, and I will get to them as I can. I'm Richard Harris, science correspondent for NPR, and I'm going to give the briefest introductions to, uh, to the folks here uh, on the panel with me. Uh, to my, to my immediate right is uh, uh, Ram Ramanathan, who is an a, a extremely distinguished climate scientist at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, but also thinks much more broadly about these issues than, than simply molecules in the atmosphere. And next to him is Dimfna Vanderlang, who is, at, uh, who is at the uh, CEO of the Clinton Climate Initiative. So, uh, so that is terrific that she's here to talk a little bit about how uh, how the uh, nonprofit world can, can make a difference here. And to my far left is Mohinder Gulati, who is uh, with Sustainable Energy for All. And I actually would like to start with you and ask you a, a question about, I mean, we tend to think about climate change, uh, in our, certainly in the political context, as something that's happening within the United States and sort of vaguely internationally. But we, we appreciate what our own issues are with climate change. We may not necessarily appreciate what other countries are facing is they are looking at, at the dual problems of climate change and providing energy. So would you give us a sense of what you are up to, uh, your organization, and to, to frame this a bit? Here's a um, thank you very much. And uh, let me first uh, set a little bit of a context which will then help us in, in, in explaining as to who we are, what we are, what do we do, and why do we do what we do. Um, in the context of our energy future, we face two major challenges. Uh, some of it you heard in the morning, uh, some of it you didn't. And those two challenges are, one is the challenge of development, and the second is the challenge of climate change. And both need to be addressed, both need to be addressed urgently and simultaneously. Let me, and, and, and I, let me explain as to how does that cre create a binding constraint on what needs to happen next in Paris or, or soon thereafter. Uh, today, uh, 1.2 billion people do not have access to electricity. That is 16% of the world's population. 2.8 billion people do not have access to uh, modern cooking and heating fuel, which is that they still use uh, solid fuels um, and in many, many countries, uh, you would see that they use three stone cook stoves. The three stone cook stove, which was invented almost at the same time when fire was invented, and we made a transition from Neanderthals to Homo sapiens. That is what tells you that that's the cooking source that is used by a very large number of uh, uh, people in the world. That's 34% of the world's population. Uh, today, uh, to less than 20, almost 20% 20 of the world's population lives at less than $1.25 a day, which is extreme poverty. So therefore, that is the challenge in the development that we face. And you cannot lift them out of poverty without having access to energy. And therefore, it, to bring that balance, to find a convergent solution, which will address both development as well as climate change, that is the critical challenge that we face. Um, one is a moral dilemma, other is an existential dilemma. Uh, what is it that SE for All does? And we'll come back to this issue of how do we deal and what are the real challenges that we, that we face. Um, the Sustainable Energy for All is an initiative launched by UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, and it is now co-led by uh, Secretary General and the World Bank President, one of the rare things where the World Bank and the UN can come together. I am from the World Bank and now I work for the UN, so I straddle both, so I have to be polite to both my bosses. Uh, 
one, one of the rare occasions when you can bring them together. And we have been able to mobilize a huge, huge partnership. We have 50 members on our board, including John Kerry is also on our board. We have a very stellar advisory board, which has uh, the governments, the, the, the private sector, the civil society, the financial industry, they are all on the advisory board. And what it does is it's, it has three objectives. One, achieving a universal access to electricity and modern energy services by 2030. Universal access by 2030. Second, doubling the share of renewable in the global energy mix. And third, doubling the rate of improvement of energy efficiency by 2030. Those are the objectives for which this Sustainable Energy for All initiative has been launched. It's a political convening platform. It's a global advocacy platform. It is creating networks and partnerships to mobilize action, catalyze business and investments and mobilize action. And as Governor Richardson said today morning, most, more unlikely the partners are, more likely they are to achieve the solutions. And we are creating this coalition of unlikely partners to achieve uh, what seems, seemed impossible, but I think we see rays of hope that we'll be able to achieve that. Right. Let well, me start with that introduction and I'll come back to it. Okay, yeah, well, there are obviously lots of questions along those lines, but I appreciate your, your laying out the ground. Let me turn next to Ram, if I could, which is, uh, uh, if you want to grab the microphone. The, uh, you, uh, I mean, you, you have a remarkable career, uh, among other things, just looking at, at molecules in the atmosphere and understanding what they do, but, but you've managed to expand that and you don't just think about molecules. I wonder if you give a flavor for, for you know, how, how, how your own thoughts have evolved about how to think about climate change. Thank you, Richard. Oh, it's really an honor to be here. I, I spent uh, the first 30 years of my research career discovering problems in the atmosphere, climate change, air pollution. I basically think of them as writing obituaries just about 10 years ago, I realized I have to take this knowledge and apply it to actually solutions. And it really cuts into what we heard from the previous speaker. So let me just give you a brief background of what's happening with the climate uh, in the coming decades. Now the predictions are converging, including my own, that we are going to see this two degree warming, not 100 years from now, but by mid-century. And then we were going to shoot past four degree by end of the century. It's a consensus amongst policymakers: two degrees is when we reach from manageable to unmanageable climate change. So the issue is, fortunately, there's still time to solve this problem. The first one is we have to recognize we have two knobs. What we normally hear is carbon dioxide. We have to cut them down. I agree with. Uh, the secretary for EPA, but that's 60% of the problem, heat added. Then we have to realize there is a second knob we have, which there are four pollutants, we call them shortly pollutants, methane, black carbon, ozone, and HFCs used as refrigerants. These have short lifetime, so dialing that knob would cut down the warming in the coming decades by almost 50%. The CO2 will take at least several decades to show up because it's long memory. Given that issue, all the things I went around the sessions here, things like decarbonization applies mainly to one billion top emitters. They put out, I am part of that one billion, 50 to 60% of the total emission. And then we focus on the bottom three billion which we heard from Dr. Gulati, their consumption of footprint is so low, it can't even count it. So it's, I consider it's most urgent to provide clean energy access to the bottom three billion. Otherwise, their footprint would go from half a ton per person now to what we all are, five to 15 tons. So there's more altruistic concerns, but even from purely selfish considerations, we got to provide clean energy access to the bottom three billion, and it, they, they do that, burn firewood at huge cost to themselves. Three million primarily women and children succumb to the cooking smoke. 
And I talked about the short-lived climate pollutants. They cost another four million, totally seven million people die each year from this air pollution. So by dialing down the shortly pollutants, we save millions of lives and get some relief from climate change in the near future. Okay, thank you. And uh, let me turn to you. This is, you, this, we've just outlined a uh, fairly significant problem to, 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 uh, to unpack and to deal with. How does, this, how does a foundation, even a, you know, a well-heeled foundation, think about attacking an issue like this? How does the, where, where, where do you pick your battles and where do you think you can make, where's your leverage essentially? Um, so first of all, thank you for the question and it's wonderful to be here. I um, feel significantly overwhelmed as probably one of the few uh, non-scientists in this room. Um, so I look out at this sea of, of very smart people and it's really quite inspiring for me to be here. Um, as you can probably tell from, from my accent and my blonde hair and my height, I am not from the United States originally, I'm from the Netherlands. and. As much as I love my country, one of the wonderful things about growing up in a very small country like the Netherlands is that almost everybody grows up there as a systems thinker. And I bring this up because there is no other way to really truly appreciate why we need to take action now unless you see and unless you're surrounded with instant feedback. And as the, the two gentlemen here know, the, the, the climate and the energy system that we work in some of the, the actions that we take right now just have a very, very long feedback period. So for policymakers and people who make investment decisions, it's very often quite difficult to really foresee both the intended consequences and the unintended consequences of those decisions. In the Netherlands, if I would decide to move this class there, there would be instant feedback because we have such a small country and we have so, so many people work, living and working in such a small space that as a young child growing up, I could not help but be a systems thinker. And I bring this up because one of the ways that the Clinton Climate Initiative addresses the issues that were just raised is by always using a whole systems approach. And I say this with a deep appreciation for how incredibly difficult it is to do that. But the reason why I bring it up is, for example, one of my main programs is focused on the small island nations. We do a lot of work with the small island nations, both in the Caribbean and the Pacific, who, who like no other, <laughs> no other um, sovereign nation, sovereign state, really understand the impact of climate change because there is immediate instant feedback with the small island nations, as you can appreciate. How we work with them is really um, moving away from thinking about interventions as one single technology intervention. So a big issue for them is diesel replacement. Um, diesel imports are incredibly expensive. Um, and so we work with them to generate, see, dis design and um, implement new ways for them to generate electricity and provide cleaner or access to cleaner electricity. Um, but obviously at the same time, because they are such a small community, we also want to work with them around water issues and land issues and waste issues. And doing all of those interactions and all of those interventions at the very same time with these small island nations gives us the opportunity to create um, resilient communities, which ultimately is what needs to happen, not just with the small island nations or with my small small country in the Netherlands, um, which will also significantly be impacted by climate change, but also in the United States and in China and in India. All these, these major economies need to really start thinking about using a whole systems approach so that they can create resilient communities and not have to continuously reinvest their very scarce resources to create um, a sustainable future for themselves. So Mohinder, does that, uh, how, how does that dovetail with what you folks are doing? And in particular, I'm interested, you mentioned how many of these people live on less than a dollar, 25 or a day, dollar and a half a day or whatever, very small. Uh, more than a billion people in this extreme poverty, and they're not thinking about climate change, and who, who can blame them for that, of course. But the question is, with energy prices so cheap right now, how do you convince, how do, how do you create a system that gives them clean and potentially a little bit more expensive energy in the short run uh, than, than to exploit the fossil fuels that are, that are av available and, and uh, inexpensive right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think these um, bottom billion are not thinking about development, uh, about climate change. They are, because they are small in, uh, islands and developing uh, states, but also many, many countries which are seriously threatened by 
climate change. And that is not just in terms of, uh, of, of, of uh, the heating of the planet. It's also in terms of the water security, food security, livelihood security, and the devastating impact that the, that the climate change has on them. And they are the least able to uh, cope up with it. They're the least able to cope up with it. So therefore, it's not that they are not thinking about it. They're just looking for solutions that are reliable, affordable, and we lift them out of poverty. They're, that's what they're hungry for. That's what they're looking for. And it is not just the solar light or solar lamp they're looking for. The solar lamp does nothing but shine light on poverty. And what they want is motive to power to be able to generate, inc to engage in income generating activities, economic activities, and lift them out of poverty. Uh, so therefore, that is what they are looking for, and and it's absolutely central. Climate change is central to that discussion in in all of these countries. Now, how do you mobilize the global community to build an international architecture that will enable affordable access to technology and capital, so that then they can invest and get out of poverty? Uh, will the uh, global community be able to put together that international architecture? which is moral, which is just, and which is equitable. And that is what we see as a role, that we are in our very small way to contributing to bring these people together to create that architecture which will be acceptable. And the, and the difficulty in, uh, in, in, in creating that architecture is twofold. One, that it is not easy to mobilize global community to overcome its um, parochial, commercial, geopolitical, and self -con selfish interests. It's not easy to, to do that. Uh, for them to rise above those interests and, and think about the global public good and think about the planet and, and uh, do something for contribute in, in, in ways that, that uh, the, the humanity can be uh, served. Second is the democratization of information. The democratization of information and instant availability of information is making those negotiations of the, in the old style very, very difficult. The old paradigms of negotiating international treaties or international uh, agreements where a bunch of wise men and women got together in a beautiful resort for a few days and, and, and sat together and did some arm twisting of each other and sometimes struck some wonderful deals and they went back to their constituents and explained to them how they had valiantly fought and brought together a, a great uh, 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 agreement uh, to, to their benefit, no longer possible. Those paradigms are gone. Today the information is instantly available, it is democratized, and in the, on the negotiating table you have hundreds of thousands of virtual negotiators on the table when you sit on the table and negotiate. And that's going to be very difficult, but it's wonderful that it is so, because that is bringing in lots of checks and balances and morality into, into that negotiation, which will then become acceptable and will be easy to convince everybody that that is the something which everybody should, 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 should follow. So therefore, we do see that, yes, this is difficult, but we uh, think there is hope. It is already happening, and um, there is this uh, 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 huge involvement of the global community, which is pushing it in the right direction. Yeah, you, you wanted to add something there. Let me. I think that your your point about the uh, about uh, the democratization of these climate negotiations and so on is, is 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 well taken. I think it also reminds us why it's really important for big actors like the U.S. and China to act because because there's a they can they have maybe a little bit more latitude. If you get the biggest emitters uh, on board, then then you can then that really helps lay the groundwork. But you wanted to add something about that. Yeah, just quickly on your observation about whether or not they're thinking about um, the impacts of climate change. So absolutely they are. And more than anything, I think, from a, a food security perspective. And with shifting climate patterns, obviously shifting rainfall patterns have occurred and therefore shifting patterns in harvesting. And the harvesting season has, has shifted in many of these rural and agricultural-based um, uh, communities. And so... From our perspective, from the Clinton Climate Initiative, we see a very, very strong need for business model innovation here. 
So a lot of the technologies that can, can address these issues in the smaller communities <coughs> have already been established. The technology innovation has occurred already and the cost curves for those technologies has significantly decreased. Um, what we really need is, is smart, innovative business leaders who can really work with these small communities and these, these um, access to energy issues to create scalable business models. So if you truly want to address the 1.2 billion people who currently have no access to clean, affordable and reliable energy, you need scalable business models to really push it out and address this issue with the size that's required and not focus on a small pilot intervention somewhere in rural India. You need to do this at scale. And for, for people and organizations to do it at scale, you need sustainable business models that generate enough cash flow so that you can actually can reinvest continuously so you can really, truly create the skill that's needed. Mm -hmm. On the, oh, sorry. No. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that it's been a few years since I've been in the developing world and talked to people about climate. And, and clearly they were observing their world changing, but they weren't necessarily connecting all the dots between that and energy. Energy seemed to be, we need energy, that, and, you know, that, that's absolute, and and the, the changes in the planet they were concerned about, but the, yeah. the, the linkages weren't there so much. It sounds as though uh, I'm a few years behind the times, perhaps, because uh, that, and maybe that maybe people are drawing those connections much more on the ground. So, Ram, did you want to add something to that? Just I wanted to pick up, uh, this is on. Yeah. We heard about this issue of uh, three billion having to cook with firewood and cow dung from Dr. Glothy. What's little known is a third of the air pollution in India, China, is, comes from this residential combustion of solid fuels, firewood and coal. And it produces a substance called black carbon or soot, which is the second largest contributor to climate change, you know, along with diesel as another source. So we recently worked on this problem and found a cook stove which would cut down the air pollution. But the issue we ran up with is that it's just too expensive. You know, the cost of the cook stove is about $70. So we are using the fact that these women, we are making them climate warriors by clean stoves and trying to hook them with the carbon market. Just one last thing I want to mention on this topic is that Secretary Hillary Clinton has started this famous uh, global alliance for cookstoves. So it's a major issue, and, and uh, many agencies have sensitized to this. So I think there's going to be a revolution in terms of providing at least cooking energy access. Yeah. The, what, uh, the last I heard, those stoves, the issue with those stoves is that, is that they are, if they break, people don't have the money to fix them. And what, and what fuel do they use anyway? That's uh, a key important issue, which we sort of addressed in this uh, project called Surya. The cook stove is what, at least two, three decades old. So many NGOs have tried to solve the problem and come back with failure. <clears throat> there are two reasons we found. First is the technologies are still not user friendly. So I would li like to appeal to all the brilliant engineers here while we are solving the problem of decarbonization for the top one billion, some of us need to work on providing clean energy access for the bottom three. And the, and the other reason they were not using this stuff was that these are high-tech stuff. So when they break or become repaired, there's nobody to take the cook stove to. Would we buy a car if you can't take it somewhere to fix it? So what we have created is these energy entrepreneur shops where they can take the stoves and get them fixed. And that has improved the uptake. But, but the main issue we find is it's a question of economics. They don't have the capital cost of $70 to put into a stove. Right. Did, yeah, I would. yeah I, I'm, I'm sure you want to sort of move on to different topics as well, but quickly on the cook stove, which as everybody and has been mentioned is a, is a passion um, that um, Secretary Clinton's very, very interested in, obviously. The, um, the feedstock supply and, and the, the, the feedstock that's going into these cook stoves and <clears throat> thinking through the supply chain to, chain to actually get the feedstock to the people who are using it is one of the issues that I was referring to earlier when I said that <clears throat> really what we need there is business model innovation and for businesses to really step into that space and, and create a business model around it. Um, obviously, it's possible to finance this. There's, there's different models of financing that have occurred in emerging market around um, IT or telecommunication or banking or other things. 
that we can learn from and apply to. So you know, the other thing is to not just think about these issues as one that is related to energy or climate or, or, or just in this particular silo. The, the ways to think creatively about solutions could happen elsewhere. Um, and so I, I think it is possible to, to address these issues, but it has been tried for, for many, many years. <laughs> no hinder. Sorry to sue to continue on the cook stove, <laughs> um, uh, but cook stoves have two problems. One has been pointed out by Professor Ramanathan, uh, which is the price. It's very high price. And second problem, hold your breath, is men. Men are a big problem for the cook stoves. Why so? <laughs> and I'll tell you why so. <laughs> because when a $70 cook stove has to be purchased, who takes the decision? Men take the decision. Who suffers if you don't take the decision? Women. Who cares? Who cares? Because when you go into a hut and you see this smoke coming from this dirty fuel which is used, men, when the cooking starts, men go out to gossip and smoke. It's the women and the infants who are trapped in that hell hole of a smoke and who cares for them. Uh, women know that this is critical for them. My mother used to cook on a coal cook stove and her earnest desire was to get LPG gas cylinder. So when I left the college and I went to the job, the first thing I did was bought her uh, LPG uh, cook stove. Women understand that. It is the men who are a problem and therefore I went, 30 years ago, I was manager of a commercial bank in a small village in UP in India, and I used to finance micro, I used to do microfinance. That word had not been invented yet then, but I, that's what I used to do. And I financed 25 biogas pl plants. And I would visit those houses, and I would see the biogas will be used for lighting, but it was never used for cooking, and the cook stove that was given to them would be hanging on the wall. And when I went there for inspection, whether the money had been utilized, they, these were you know, the, the very poor people. For them, they, if the bank manager had a cup of tea at the house, was a status symbol, and therefore they wanted to, me to have a cup of tea, and I refused if the cook stove was on the, on the wall. So therefore, I, I had to teach them. They said, we don't know how to use it. So I had to connect the cook stove with the gas pipeline, with the biogas pipe, show them how it works, which was very simple, and every time I would go there, I would have tea only if I saw the cook stove being used for cooking. So, and I asked them as to why don't they use it? Oh, because the way it cooks, men don't like it. That's the problem. It sounds as, but, though, uh, uh, it sounds as though men care more about climate change than, uh, than the health of their families. That's, uh, it sounds like we have some, some fairly substantial problems to deal with here. Uh, could you give us an example of, 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 of progress that you, that you can point to that your, that your program has made in, in, in actually putting clean energy on the ground places? Uh, this initiative was launched just in 2012. In 2013, we put together a team, uh, June 2013. So this is just about one year old. We are, not, uh, we are still struggling with a startup. Uh, and in this one year, we have been able to uh, create a partnership with one, more than 100 countries. More than 100 countries have signed up. We have uh, got nine hubs. One of those is in Copenhagen, uh, which is uh, on energy efficiency. We have a renewable hub, energy efficiency hub. We have a capacity development hub in uh, the Energy Research Institute in Delhi. Uh, we have also got regional hubs, which is the Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, we have got a lot of businesses which are creating these high-impact opportunities and catalyzing business. So, for example, there is an HIO, as we call it, uh, high-impact opportunities. There's mini-grid, uh, clean access, clean mini-grid uh, uh, HIO. There's one on biofuel. So that's how we are uh, we are generating these uh, partnerships. Are, people, are, are and, people seeing the difference on the ground? I mean, if you wanted to, if a politician says, show me what you're doing, take me to a village where there's a difference, where do you take them? Okay, uh, since we are not an implementing or a financing organization, we are, we are catalyzing business. But let me give you an example where Professor Ramanathan also is, the invention that he talked about is also uh, uh, applied there. In the desert in Gujarat, which is run of Kutch, there are these women salt pan workers who pump brine water, which is 45% uh, concentration of salt in the water. They, they pump using diesel pumps, they pump brine water for making salt 
by putting the salt pans and crystallizing it. And the cost of diesel in their total cost structure was 80%. 80% of the cost of making salt was uh, a cost of diesel. Um, and uh, if we, there was a pilot that was launched um, last year where uh, 20 uh, solar water pumps were given. So this diesel water pumps were replaced by a solar water pump. And those 20 water pumps, uh, the demonstration of that was that uh, the payback period on that was three years. So they could generate, they could save uh, something like $1,000 a year uh, for, by using uh, uh, solar water pumps instead of diesel pumps. So therefore, the package that was given was a solar water pump, a solar lantern, and a cook stove, which was poorly designed. And when the women started using it, they said they needed some innovation, they needed some changes, and those changes were made in those cook stoves, and those became highly acceptable. And there was also a device that is used with the cook stove, which measures for how many hours at a certain temperature it has been used, so you can measure how much is the carbon saving. And that was the innovation Professor Ramanathan was talking about. So thank you very much to you, sir, that we are using it there in that project. This year, just last month, uh, we were there, and the uh, SEVA, which is this NGO uh, in, in India, they distributed, financed actually, 400 water pumps. From 20, they went to 400 in one year. And their plan is to go to 70,000. Uh, and this is a huge, huge change that you can see on the ground. Uh, the, one of the poorest of the poor in the world uh, who, are, who find solar water pumps in that solar package uh, financially viable and, and, and uh, uh, very, very attractive uh, investment. So if you have bankers in this room, here is this great opportunity. Uh, investment which can give you a payback period of three years, you can't really get a better return than that anywhere in the world. Yeah. Since we're the first uh, plenary and we're supposed to be setting up uh, sort of the, the conference in general, I want to step back and ask a big picture question of you, uh, Ram, which is the uh, we're, everyone talks about two degrees c centigrade or Celsius as being the, essentially a, a target that was, that was agreed upon more by politicians and scientists, or although it's clearly a, a collaboration between the two. But could you give us a, a – you, and you seem fairly convinced that we're going to see those temperatures. But what, what does that really represent, and is there a better way of thinking about um, identifying real danger zones, real red lines in the, in the climate? Thank you, Richard. To me, in the climate change issue – one of the major challenges which I have not heard spoken as much is this urgency that in about 30 to 40 years, we are going to see two degree warming. So you can ask, we are already halfway up there. The planet has already warmed about eight tenth of a degree. So you can ask, what's the big deal about two degrees? If you go back to the climate record of the last million years, you can't find such a warm planet. You have to go back even earlier than that. So we have no analog for how such a planet would behave. And, and so that's what, as a scientist, terrorizes me to think about such a planet. Fortunately, I won't be alive to see that. So, and there are a number of things we talk about, the severe weather. They all come from basic physics, thermodynamics. When you heat the air, it holds more moisture. We know exactly how much, about 7 to 10 percent more. So then your storms would be more intense. Your snowfall would be more intense. And then add to that flooding and droughts. So I don't see society prepared for that urgency. The first thing is, I told you about two knobs the black carbon, methane, HFCs, even with those knobs. Fortunately, we have technologies to bring them down. California has cut its soot emissions by 90%. And it helped improve the economy. So we know how to do that. Even with all my second knob, I don't see how we can avoid two degrees. So at the minimum, we have to prepare society. The way the Dutch took care of sea level, the dikes, I don't think countries like India can't afford this. It's just hugely expensive. 
and I, I don't see this awareness. We are focusing on decarbonizing the economy, which is a must, so don't get me wrong, but that's not going to help us. Carbon dioxide is like a super tanker. It's going to help us avoid this four degree warming 50 years from now. The next 30, 40 years, our chance is to cut down this shortly pollutants. And I don't see society talking about that. How is the two degree planet going to look like? My own estimate is that I spent a lot of time in villages. The bottom three billion who had nothing to do, very little to do with this are going to suffer the worst consequences. That is the moral dilemma. So what I'm doing is I'm a I'm member of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences. So we work with the Vatican and other religious leaders to persuade them this has become a moral issue, ethical issue. Scientists or even politicians don't have the authority to moral authority, ask people to change their behavior, but the religious leaders do. So I'm looking forward to the encyclical, which Pope Francis is going to release in summer, and then we are persuading other religious leaders to do the same. Now let me ask you a big picture question as well. So you, uh, your, your framework is thinking about things in systems terms. Yeah. In this country, we have a big systems problem. So turn your, turn your attention not to the developing world, but to us, which is that we seem to look at energy as one thing and climate issues as a completely other thing. And it doesn't seem like, in terms of policy and in terms of the way we think of energy, it's like, oh, gas prices are going down, that's great. You know, but, you know, the climate's getting worse, that's bad. We don't, but we don't integrate that. I, that conversation into a system. Do you have a sense about how we could change the conversation in order to make those two separate conversations come together and be thought of as one system? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, a wonderful question. And I actually think that it was already answered um, just by the gentleman next to me, which really articulates the need to um, not shy away from what, what is a very difficult conversation and not shy away from um, both on the policy side and the, the business community and the investment community and the science community to really articulate which decisions need to be made, that um, some of those are going to be very, very difficult but have to be made, um, that is still possible to mitigate against climate change, um, but that that is going to um, require a whole systems approach. And so I think um, in, in the United States, but also in China and India and in Europe, quite frankly, where we always sort of assume and think of ourselves as leaders in, in this space, quite frankly, we aren't at the moment. Um, true leadership is, is coming from unexpected countries like China at the moment. So I think that the, the need for a um, scientific but an, an honest based conversation about what those decisions are um, and what the consequences of those decisions are is going to be what's going to be required. Um, I really appreciate your, your bringing up sort of the, the possibility for leadership from the religious communities. Um, I was really pleased to see um, our Pope stand up and, and really take leadership there and articulate his vision, which quite frankly, he did the same thing. He said, we need to have an honest conversation about these issues and address them holistically. Um, but that is not easy. Again, I've said it in the, in the beginning as well. It, that is not an easy conversation to have necessarily. And the, um, the sense of urgency that actually when I, I started to write down my notes, it's the first word I wrote down. It's the first word that I always write down when I speak about these things is that I have a deep sense of urgency. Um, I am a mother of a nine-year-old girl who I love and adore more than anything in life. And so... As, as somebody who's always trying to inspire new leaders and young emerging emerging leaders in the climate and energy space, they need to start thinking about this as a systems issue as well. And we have, we have I think, we have a, a key role to play there. And, and in the United States, the, the possibilities for, for the existing leadership and, and the emerging leaders to have that conversation, have it together, I think really is there. And, and as the administrator was saying earlier, there is momentum. Um, and so there is space that needs to be created to have this honest conversation. Let me, let me take some questions from the audience. Uh, here's one. World population is headed toward 10 to 12 billion. How should population growth be factored into the climate conversation? Anyone want to take on that? Uh, I, I mean, are, do you think about that, about 
as, as you look down the line for, for renewable energies, are you not only thinking about the people who need energy now, but the people who will need it 20 years from now? I think uh, Professor Ramanathan uh, did allude to that fact that um, top one billion, how much they consume, and the bottom three billion, how much do they consume? Uh, yes, I mean population uh, does create that pressure because it demands more energy, it demands more water, it demands more food, it demands more housing, it demands more and more of everything. It's not only just the numbers; it's also the uh, changing lifestyles are uh, very consumption-intensive lifestyle. Uh, as the incomes grow, that becomes very consumption-intensive lifestyle. So therefore, it's not just the numbers, it's also the, the changing lifestyle that will have an impact. Uh, and um, let me, let me uh, take this uh, opportunity for bringing in this issue of behavioral change. Um, the poor uh, cannot uh, change their behavior because they cannot afford to. The rich do not change their behavior because they can afford not to. And let me tell you, they explain what it means. You can do all that you want about energy efficiency and it will reduce the, the energy consumption and it will reduce the carbon emission. And therefore, you can change the vehicle fuel efficiency from 30 miles per gallon to 35 miles per gallon. But if you, each one of you is going to drive an SUV uh, around the beltway, then going from 30 miles to 35 miles per gallon is not going to do the trick. And this is one word, which is a conservation, that I do not hear in the conversation. That it's not only that we need to consume whatever we consume more efficiently by having more efficient appliances, but we also need to consume less. We are consuming just way too much. <laughs> and we don't have to consume too, that much for the derived benefits that we get. So I'm not saying we need to reduce our derived benefits. We can get the same derived benefits by just consuming less and wasting less. And that's a behavioral change which you don't need. You need public policies. You need some leadership. But each one of us in the room has to make the change. And each one of you scientists have to help us how to do it. And that, that actually... That actually plays into a question that uh, I was going to ask uh, in a moment, which is that uh, someone says, you know, what about energy efficiency? Uh, in the, you know, it says, access, you know, that's obviously important, as you just said, but access and energy efficiency are often addressed independently. How do we bring them together? I guess that's another systems question, isn't it? No, absolutely. And we, we whenever we approach, um, we work with our small our small communities, we, we start with energy efficiency. Quite frankly, it'd be just foolish not to. And so the first thing we do is looking at energy efficiency. And and just as you were alluding to, just also just thinking through what, not not reducing the access to energy services, but really think very carefully about how, how much is needed to do a certain um, activity. Um, the other thing around energy efficiency that, that there is a tremendous opportunity here in the United States and elsewhere to really work with um, corporations. And so one of the programs that we have with the Clinton Climate Initiative, which is just fantastic and very innovative, is where we work with large corporations and um, we work with them to really offer energy benefits to their employees as almost like a 401k or a health benefit. And so what that does is you, if you work with large employers, you create skill immediately because they have thousands and millions of, of people who work for them. And so if we have the opportunity to work with these large employers in the United States, which we are currently doing, and offering energy benefits through their um, payroll as a payroll de deduction that can be used to um, pay for energy retrofits in the house and the homes of the people who work for them. That's a wonderful way to address issues around energy um, usage and energy efficiency. Thank you. Here's another question from the audience. Uh, a generation ago, three quarters of the people were rural. A generation from now, uh, three quarters of people will live in cities with higher demands. How will this change the best climate change strategy to pursue? <laughs> yeah, again, that will probably have a much big, bigger impact than many things we have talked about. Like I said, the, the three billion who live in villages, their carbon footprint, half a ton per year. Average for the whole globe is about five tons. 
So this mass flux of people going from rural to cities is going to tremendously enhance. And they're not even enjoying a good life by going drifting into cities. And they are forced because there's no energy in the rural areas. They can't do enough farming to feed themselves. And the other thing I want to mention in that regard, we talked about consumption. I think that's the number one problem in terms of climate change. Population-wise, it's more the consumption by the top one or two billion. I'm not promoting population explosion. And we talked about efficiency. I want to bring up the waste. One third of the food we produce is wasted. So if you look at what is the third largest contributor to CO2 emissions after China and US is the food waste. So that's enough to feed another two billion. So the issue in terms of population is not can we feed the population, it's more can we sustain the lifestyle. There, there, actually, there's a there's a couple more questions on that general theme, and let me let me go to this one next, which is what is the role of younger generations in developing more systems thinking on climate and energy? How much does how much you know how much can we count on our youth to save themselves, if you will? Yeah. Um, well, I, I hope I hope 100 percent we can depend on them because they're quite frankly are going to be in charge of it. So. Um, I mean, it's a wonderful question, and um, I, I'm personally incredibly passionate about inspiring our emerging leaders to really step up to this, this place and, and really carve out a way for them to engage um, in systems thinking and, and really become well-versed in articulating what that actually means um, so that when they do um, grow into positions of leadership, both on the policy side and in, in industry and in the financial markets, they they really truly understand the need for um, thinking through their decisions so that they can articulate the intended consequences of that decision and the unintended consequences of those decisions. And so we do a lot of work, and I myself do a lot of um, thinking about how do we engage these emerging leaders. Um, one way that we feel is a very powerful way to do it is by using simulations, which I'm sure many in this room would appreciate. And so we work with an organization called Climate Interactive, which has developed um, a model that's instantaneous um, world energy uh, model. And so what it teaches um, students, and, and we engage with students in the United States, and hopefully we'll do so in um, the Middle East and in China and India and other um, economies in the world, is what it teaches the students is really, first of all, that, that it is still possible to mitigate against climate change. Secondly, that it is going to be complicated, but that they have a role to play there. And thirdly, that, that small steps and in, in, in incremental changes do make a difference as long as they're aware of their need to scale those up and not just do those in isolation, but really find ways that they can, um, they can find ways to, to tell that story and, and replicate it and, and possibly find different business models around it so that they actually um, can in, um, implement it at scale. Um, and so I know that there's a session tomorrow afternoon, I think it's around two o'clock, um, that will be really focused on how do you use simulation and data-driven decision tools for emerging leaders so that they become versed in this, this language and, and feel empowered and, and compelled to step up to that place. I think a, a related question, which I will address to Mohinder, and you can add your thoughts to that last question as well, is uh, I have a question about uh, whether this idea of leapfrog technology is is a real thing. I mean, clearly we saw it in 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 cell phones in in Africa and around the world that basically no one bothers with phone lines in in places in in places that didn't have cell service or didn't have phone service before. So that's a fantastic leapfrog technology. The question is, how applicable is that really to to renewable energy? Is that is that you know is is that a pipe dream or is that for real? Yeah, um, let me start with the question on the youth, and then I'll come to that uh, second one. Uh, in, a, in, in, in the course of our work, we have been engaging the youth at every level. And um, one thing that I find very heartening is, much more than us, they have a very clear commitment, they have a passion, and they have much more clarity of thought than, than, than we have. And therefore, that, that is a hope. And we have engaged them at levels. We go to the universities. They come to our, our, our uh, work uh, place. We have also um, uh, gone to several universities to talk to, to, the, to the youth. And uh, last climate uh, uh, summit in September in New York, we also had a band, Lincoln Park, 
who came to our event. And then what have happened, what I've noticed, they came to Vienna for a big show. There was in Vienna, there was this hall full of, I don't know, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 uh, people, uh, young people uh, list, come to listen to this Linkin Park band. And they start their program talking about energy and climate change. They are doing work in every country, and that's how they start. And therefore, they, they committed that every show they will start with a film and talk about energy and climate change. I mean, imagine how motivated they are and how, impact, how much impact does it have. And, and it's, the, it's the youth who will really bring about change. And the momentum that you see today has not come from people like us. The people marching on the streets, and you saw so many out in the New York when the climate uh, summit was happening and happening all over the world, that, I have to say, didn't come from us. It came from the young people, and therefore they are the hope, and that's what they will bring about the change. On the leapfrog, leapfrog technology, uh, I am um, not a scientist, so therefore I would refrain from charting, go, walking into that territory, but I'll talk about the innovation in, leapfrog uh, in, in leapfrogging in the business uh, model innovation. And huge, huge amount of work is happening. I was in Bangladesh, you go to Africa. There is so much innovation happening in ways that they are bringing convergence between technology, finance, and, and information uh, technology. They, you see the convergence between mobile technology and energy even in, in Africa. They are packaging it together that they can provide a very small system to the cell phone, provide, to the cell phone consumers who, don't, who have cell phones but don't have energy. And they can, uh, that, that package can be controlled through the cell phone system that they can, can, they can check the usage and they can pay for the usage by kilowatt hours or by number of hours through their cell phone because they are a consumer of that, uh, that firm. So they, it's a mobile, it's, it's a, it's a uh, mobile uh, uh, service providers uh, uh, who are coming into the business of uh, energy. So therefore, we see a lot of innovation in the business models, but on the technology issue, uh, I would uh, maybe hand over to Professor Ramanathan to talk about that. <laughs> Do you want to say a word about that? And then I have another question for you. Just very quickly, uh, cell phones are really revolutionizing our ability to understand and collect data. Just to give one example, uh, this is my daughter's work. She's a wireless technologist. She is able to monitor every hut in the f several thousand homes we are working in. And we get data every day, whether they are using our stuff or the mud stuff. And that's enabling us to provide them with climate credit. But it's just one example. I think on the leapfrogging, just one thing I want to kill. This, I, it's not my, I heard a, a solar energy expert. We, the top one billion, cannot afford solar power, but a bottom three billion can, hmm. because they don't need huge infrastructure. You just put a photovoltaic on top of a hut, they have power. So I think those are the two. Yeah, and and uh, I guess the question is whether they can whether they will be satisfied with with whether the rest of the technology will come along that will be low energy technology as they start uh, adding their computers and their everything else that we have and we take for granted because it's you know a small trickle of electricity helps provide light at night and students can read and that's a fabulous advance but that's only the it's only the first step so here's another question which is. Um, uh, does your work on climate change relate to conservation of other resources, for example, trees, rare earth metals, et cetera? Should the conversation shift to a larger view of resource consumption? I just want to add one quick response to that. Last May, uh, Professor Das Gupta of Cambridge University and I were asked by Pope Francis to organize a meeting on exactly this topic. Hmm. And we had over 10, 15 Nobel laureates, theologians, every, just in a small group of 80. And of course, one issue which was highlighted, I didn't know until then, species extinction could become even a bigger problem than climate change. Apparently, there, just in the last century, the species extinction has increased by a factor of 10 to 100. We're not talking about 10%, 20%. And we wrote a long document, and then we were asked to summarize this in two sentences. And you know what came out was just remarkable. It basically said the only way we're going to be able to solve this problem 
is we have to change our attitude to each other. Don't think of the three billion living in remote villages. They are part of us. And the second is we have to change our attitude towards nature. Now, let me ask you about that as well. I mean, I mean, because part of what I mean, if you once you start realizing how big the systems are you're dealing with, yeah. it can be overwhelming to think about. I mean, an organization, no matter how well intentioned, can't take on rare earths and everything yeah. else. And so, how how do you pick and choose without, in fact, uh, you know, then stepping back from the systems approach? Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and, and honestly, there are moments when I am overwhelmed because if you're a systems thinker, there is no limitation to the system because we are the system. Everything we do here, us sitting here is, is the system. So, um, it can be overwhelming at times, but the, I think our approach and the way we look at it is really my responsibility is to create stronger and, and more resilient communities. So whatever that means for the community that we're working with is how we would look at it. And so, for example, um, just restoration and conservation in some of the, the, the parts of the world where we work is, is the main issue. Um, in Africa and, and South America, these are the incredibly important um, issues that we need to think about. So whenever possible, we will bring those into the, the conversations that we have with the communities and when we're engaging with them because in, in the end, these are all about livelihoods. And so if we remove some of um, the natural resources that, that these communities are surrounded with, we will remove their livelihoods. And that is never... A, a, a good end result that is never something that creates a stronger and more resilient community. So um, if and when possible, we will look at, at natural resources more broadly defined and not just at energy surfaces. Um, we are just about, we have just a couple minutes left. Let me uh, grab one uh, which sort of plays off of this, which is what are win-win opportunities to mitigate climate change and protect biodiversity? I don't know if anyone wants to do that. We could, we could, um, it's a little, maybe, a, I, I think another panel actually later today would be better and yeah. able to answer that question. I will not, I will put you on. But this is, this. Let me, let's ask this sort of this final question, which is, uh, again, paraphrasing very broadly, it's a, a question about lifestyle. And do you think, you know, the kids are going to make the difference, right? But are they, are they willing to have, you know, a lifestyle that is less energy intensive, that, that is, that is a, uh, that is sort of living sm smaller on the land, because it seems as though, you know, the way we've been driving for so long has been, you know, more and more easier and easier, bigger and bigger and whatnot. And that's a, that's a huge change. And I don't know, um, if you guys think about that as well, uh, when you think about what the energy demand needs to be in these countries or, or, you know, how you, how you start turning things around. But, yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's, um, I, I, I think about that every single day. And I think a lot of that is really the responsibility for, for our existing sort of generations that in our conversations with younger generations, those are the things that we, we highlight and we articulate. Um, and there, there, again, as, as somebody who grew up in a small country, there, there was not a day when my mother didn't mention to me that I needed to conserve our, our natural resources. Not a day, probably not like half a day even when she wouldn't say something about it. So I think a lot of this is really truly leadership and each individual in this room and both as an individual in your family and your, your own communities, but also in the jobs that we all do that constantly articulate the need for being um, thoughtful and respectful and mindful of the fact that this is a this is a finite earth and so therefore we have to articulate and we have to talk about this every single day yeah i mean um, I, we have to change our behavior to be able to do that but the younger generation doesn't have to change because that is their behavior they don't have to change it. And I do see that, at least, you know, I, I see that all around that the younger generation, the children, they have absolutely no problem uh, with that at all. I mean, they, have, they are willing to accept the consequences of lesser consumption and le a little bit of discomfort uh, as long as they know that this is what they're contributing to. So therefore, they are much more committed, and I really don't see that. It is actually the parents who, who fret about that more 
we are the ones who worry about it more and we are the ones who feel gu- guilty in not giving them more and more it's not the children are demanding more and more it's that we feel guilty in not giving them more and more and i i really don't see that problem at all that the children actually are willing to accept a little bit of discomfort and a little bit of uh, uh, of less consumption in in uh, in in this interest and uh, uh, I, I i that's what i see day in and day out well, let's, uh, let's least, end on that yeah. very hopeful note. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes.